What is up guys, Chris here again with another chapter review of the Four Nights of the Apocalypse. And after a week long break and digesting the full reveal of Arthur Pendragon at the end of the previous chapter, which by the way, the last video, it's been two weeks and at this point of me recording, it is roughly 800 views. That is the most viewed video out of all of my uh, Four Nights reviews as well as my manga reviews in general. The only one that is beat up right now is with a thousand views is my first review of Blue Exorcist. So that's actually a really fun thing to do and I honestly hope that future review videos will get those types of views from this point onwards as I do see these videos continuously getting more views week after week. So I'm the This Four Nights content is basically carrying this channel at this point and I am just so happy and I'm glad that you guys are enjoying my content. So I will promise to make more Fortnite's content outside of the chapter reviews sometime in the future. Maybe I'll do a video explaining what we know of Percival's powers and maybe what could possibly happen to King Arthur. But at the moment, I'm not entirely sure. That's just, you know, me speculating at some point. But before I get into the actual video, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell for updates on future videos. It really helps. I'm currently at like 650 subscribers and... With the pace that my channel has been gaining steam, hopefully by the fall, if I stay the same pace, I will reach a thousand subscribers. I expect by the end of the month, I'm hoping, I will reach 700. Because as, as of this point, my subscriber count has been increasing 100 every single month. So if things go well, then I could actually reach a thousand views. A thousand subscribers. So I'm just, I'm just ecstatic. The channel is growing very quickly, you know, a lot, quick, a lot quicker than I thought it would. And I honestly wish I, I started covering stuff like Seven Deadly Sins earlier. But yeah, all that out of the way. Please subscribe to the channel to help me get to that 1,000 subscriber mark. Like the video to show YouTube that uh, these videos are actually being viewed and liked by other people. And also don't forget to check out my Patreon and help out with uh, the channel as I, am I do have some rewards on there. The patron-only Discord as well as access to polls and special requests for the particular reviews and video topics. And also don't forget to tip me over on coffee to help add a little extra something to make sure that I can keep these videos going. But without further ado, let's get on with the video. As we all know, last week Arthur's full-on reveal was something that was just incredibly hype and was pretty much the main focus of the chapter despite it only being a few pages at the end. We got the aftermath of Sistana, Percival kind of contemplating over what's going on, and the possibility that maybe one of the seven daily sins is connected to, to Sin the Fox. Thus giving us a bit more speculation on who, who Sin might actually be. But this chapter starts off directly after chapter 22. And this chapter is very aptly called Arthur Pendragon. We start off with Ironside kneeling before uh, Arthur. And basically Arthur just somewhat... Uh, talking down to Einstein, saying how disappointing he is and how difficult it is for him to understand how he managed to get bested uh, by one of the Four Nights of the Apocalypse and that he failed to destroy Leonis, the largest uh, force that they have to deal with. And how he even makes it worse, that it's embarrassing that he lost to a child, even if he was a member of the Four Nights of the Apocalypse. In fact, one of the Four Nights that is a child, in fact. Ironside says he'll accept any punishment, but then we get a nice menacing panel of Arthur looking at Ironside, saying saying that he likes that aspect of him, as something grabs Ironside's arm and pierces through his chest. And we see this demented, demonic, chaotic uh, panel of just these chaos beasts grabbing at Ironside, piercing his chest, biting him and then bleeding and shit. This is... I feel like this is something that would be straight out of Berserk. I think... I honestly think... Uh, Nakaba Suzuki is honestly going to... Is actually really, really going out of his way with these chaos powers. I think this is something that he's been wanting to do considering how much effort he puts into panels involving chaos creatures and the power of chaos in general. So yeah. Ironside's gut is basically being pierced. He's spitting up blood. And Arthur begins to monologue. And I'm going to say this word for word right now. Arthur is stating that, he, that a land with no pain, no sadness, where no one is left exposed to any kind of threat or calamity. That is Camelot, the everlasting kingdom. But between the seven deadly sins and this new quartet, as long as these threats remain, we will never have true repose. 
and I like that in this panel we actually get to see Arthur's black eyes when he's because as we know from the end of the Simply Sins that helps signify that he is using his chaos powers and is a full sign that he is the king of chaos. He then goes on to say that from the past, from the from the past holy war to the one that was 16 years ago, mankind has basically been sucked into all these different conflicts from other from other species and has basically suffered from it. But Arthur wants to free Britannia for mankind. And that's why he has to protect Camelot, because he believes that the kingdom will actually uh, bring forth this dream of his and help keep humanity safe from these particular different conflicts and other species. Now, I'm still very curious as to what brought upon this ideology for Arthur, as yes, before he wanted a kingdom, an everlasting kingdom, a place that, well, everyone can be safe. But he was friends with the Seven Deadly Sins. He was friends with Meliodas, Bond, King Elaine, and uh, Deanne. But now he's strictly against all the other species, all the other races, and he basically wants to eliminate them. And for some reason, he needed the Coffin of Eternal Darkness to eliminate uh, Leonis, primarily because it is the strongest force since Meliodas and Elizabeth are the king and queen, and they have some of the strongest holy knights. Problem with like, uh, Gil Thunder, Hauser, Griamor, just to name the well known ones, along with. Uh, Along with Henderson and Dreyfus, former Holy Knight Grand Masters, who I assume all of them have gotten a huge power up over the last 16 years, even having their own lives. But yeah, I am very curious as to what particularly happened to Arthur, and this could be tied to the Seven Deadly Sins Cursed by Life film, as we do see him in said movie, and in one quick shot, it shows that he is in tears, he is crying. So it's very possible that. Over the 16 years, he's, stone, he's sealed himself for whatever it is he is planning. But anyway, back to the chapter. Arthur tells Ironside not to disappoint him with careless errors like this ever again. Because it appears Arthur values Ironside more than anyone else. As in, once that tentacle thing gets removed from his chest, all of a sudden, he's perfectly fine. He realized he's fine. There's no pain, there's no injury, no scarring. As the very next panel, we see a very cheerful Arthur, almost Meliodas-like in his like when he's teasing or just having fun, saying, That took all the poison out, didn't it? So this is a huge tone shift from the menacing and proud uh, ruler that Arthur has been portrayed as in the end of the last chapter and everything up to this point. He did a huge personality shift. Just being goofy now, super happy. As now Ironside just says he'll swear to travel Britannia to defeat Percival and and to live up to his expectations. But now Arthur says that he doesn't really forget, that he doesn't really care about that anymore, to just forget it. And that there's something even mo more important for him to ask. As now we're getting it, it appears it appears like we're getting Arthur's true personality again, despite this whole weird ideology this new ideology he has it still kind of sounds like the actual arthur now that he's basically more or less dropped the facade of a tyrannical ruler arthur goes on to say that they've been basically stalled in this battle in every turn and it's bothering him a lot asking erlen if she agrees with him and one thing to note is that merlin has not spoken a single word throughout this chapter i'm just saying this from now merlin has been kept silent i don't know why Perhaps we're going to save that for maybe an info dump or something later down the road. But anyway, Arthur says, is basically asking him if he knows why they've been stalled this whole time. And it's because of something called the vision. And that's how they've been able to view, basically learn of things from the future and intercept their, their attempts at every single turn. And that, and Ironside is asking if he wants him to retreat it. Arthur just says, no, but that's a nice guess. He wants something more important. And that also they'd be on the lookout for something like that. He's found he something even better. And as Ironside asks this, Arthur just looks at him with a smile saying, I'm asking you to search for my bride. As on a, a bit of a confused look on, on Ironside's face is like, what? Wait, so, now Ar and so now Arthur is looking for a bride. He just went from destroying Leonis to... Talking about this thing called the vision that apparently um, uh, Leonis has, and for all we know, this could be 
King Bartra if he is in fact still kicking as he does have this magical power that is called the Vision, I believe, that can actually foresee great calamities. That, help, that basically foretold the Seven Deadly Sins returning to Leonis after everything that happened with the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments showing up and basically uh, plunging Britannia into chaos, so on and so forth. So perhaps they're talking about King Bartra. But with that out of the way, we then jump back to Sistana with everyone in town basically is trying to rebuild. The Duke of the town, An's father, says that he can hardly imagine Sistana would have been uh, all right without without their help. As we then get a nice little jovial and lighthearted panel of the, of our main trio of Donnie, Percival, and Nazians as they kind of look happy, Percival just says that the, a bunch of houses were destroyed. But, they, but the mayor says that they can all be fixed, and I, they're just glad they didn't lose a single person, and that's actually more important. Nazianz once once again brings up the fact of who, what kind of holy knights that Sim, that Sim brought that took out all those chaos creatures, and where are they now? Sim just says that there's forest friends, and that they're probably off having breakfast or something. Even Donnie's asking to tell the truth, but now, now it's basically like Percival, or I, I think it was Nazi ends that just says, you know what, who cares now? The mayor says, he, un the mayor talks to Percival saying that he understand that he, that he understands that he's a son of Ironside, and it probably was kind of difficult to avoid. But fighting his own pa own father must have been terrible and painful. But Percival kind of just laughs it off, saying that it's fine. He just stomped him because he wanted to. Donnie asks the obvious question, you know, he, he just asks him, he knows Ironside. How do you know him? As we then get a nice little panel of it, what it looks like a young Baldus and Ironside alongside Merlin, Arthur, and the samurai from the Seven Sins that we didn't really get much of in the original, which I assume we'll probably see him more in this series since he was more or less supporting Arthur throughout everything in the Seven Deadly Sins after they met. So we go on to learn that An's mother was actually one of the strongest Holy Knights in Camelot and served right under King Arthur himself. He said, and that she said he was a noble and upright man, constantly striving to do good. The Duke says that's sure not the impression that he gave him. Now this could le now I'm going to talk about this at the end of the video really quick about Ironside's story about Volga, the two Volgus and Ironside somewhat betraying King Arthur in a way, yet still working for King Arthur 16 years ago. So this is something very confusing. But with all of that. He, he begins to ask Percival to ask him to do one favor for him. As we then see On walking up to everyone, and I do have to, I have to admit I like On's new outfit. New, her hair is a lot shorter, so she has a new hairstyle and new clothing. So that's also really nice. It's not, it's more for fighting. So yeah, I'm I, I'm a fan of it. I like it. As her father, and now we're, with everyone looking at how she's changed, literally within a day, with her look, her father just says that she looks a lot like her mother when she was young. She begins to talk, listen. She begins to say that she's serious, she wants to become a holy knight just like her mother. But the fight with Ironside taught her that she still has a long way to go and that she lacks experience and power. So she wants to set off to become a true holy knight so that she can protect the people that are closer to her even if she is all alone. But her father basically just shouts out she, he understands exactly how she feels, but he can't allow her to journey by herself. And just as he's about to retort, why can't you basically see it her way, she doesn't realize, wait, what exactly do you mean? As he said, journey all alone. And she then turns over to Percival, Donnie, and Nazians as Percival jumps down from the little pile of rubble that he was on, asking on that she should come along with them. And join them. With his, with her father just saying that she really is her mother. Obstinate, competitive, strong-willed, everything. As with tears in her eyes, being so happy, just stating, "But I've got your eyebrows, father." They smile at each other with tears, and say, "As her father says, I'll always be cheering you on." Sin looking from on top of them, and Percival and the others smiling, with the end of the chapter. Now, I know I kind of rambled on with everything with Arthur at the beginning, because that was the main point of this. But, yeah, this was honestly a really good chapter. I like that we got more of Arthur, and now we know he's not just some super bad villain. He 
still feels like the actual Arthur. He can still joke around, kind of blow things off. He's not super serious. He is not just a straight up bad guy. Because this does feel like the Arthur we know and love after that whole chaos, that weird chaos thing where he basically, it was almost like an instantaneous torture session. But he just did all that to remove all the poison from Ironside's system to bring him back to full strength. So yeah, obviously Arthur has fully mastered his chaos powers. He literally did not really make any type of motion to activate them. He was just doing them while sitting in his throne. The interesting thing is that Merlin did not take a, say a single word. Perhaps she had nothing to add to the conversation or because something happened and maybe she lost her voice. That's something I'm not entirely sure of. Now, the whole conversation about Arthur having a bride, I'm not entirely sure who that could be. Perhaps it will be a new character that will be introduced later down the road. Perhaps it might end up being on herself, but that would be kind of weird considering that Arthur should be in like his 30s by now. Eh, it's all kind of confusing. But the main thing I want to bring in is Anne's connection to Percival and the fact that her mother was under the same brigade, the same Holy Knight Brigade, as Percival's father and grandfather, and most likely Pelgard as well. And the thing is that in Chapter 1, we were told that they did something to betray Arthur. But uh, Volgus Volga just said that he didn't betray him, just abandoned him, took Percival, and left. What exactly they did, I'm not entirely sure, but this could also be the reason why Ann's mother is dead, or perhaps maybe permanently transformed into a chaos creature. But the question still remains, why is Ironside still working for Arthur? I mean, Arthur does seem to be a pretty forgiving guy. I mean... Literally, Ironside was given the important task of wiping out Leonis, and he just straight up healed him. I mean, a small torture session to get po small torture session to get out a bunch of poison, but still, it basically just waved it off as no big deal. I'm curious to see what exactly happened in the past. We are due for a flashback at some point later on in the series, because this is a big, pretty big mystery. But yeah, I enjoyed this chapter a lot. There's not too much to go off of. Except for the fact that Arthur still kind of feels like the same Arthur, just he changes ideologies and he's a bit more extreme from what we can tell. And um, Anne is kind of the Percival through their parents. So, yeah, I'm honestly kind of liking where this, where this series is going at this point. I don't really have much to add other than the fact that next we're going to begin our trek to Leonis now and they have the ex still have the exact same part of the Coffee of Eternal Darkness that Meliodas had in the original series. So yeah, we're obviously going to start heading towards Leonis. Whether they meet another member of the Four Knights of the Apocalypse before then is beyond me. But yeah, that was all for this video. I hope you guys really did enjoy. If you have any speculations on what happened in the past with Ironside, with Ironside and Aunt's mother, or what they did to betray Arthur in the past, what exactly caused uh, Arthur to have this... A bit of a twisted ideology in making Camelot a place where humans can basically live in peace and prosperity, but basically condemn all the other races. What brought him to want to fight the seven deadly sins? Leave that all down in the comments down below. And don't forget to hit the, hit the notification bell for updates on future videos and subscribe to the channel. It really does help. Inching ever closer to 1,000 subscribers. And I will... And I will attempt to make more Fortnite's content that is not chapter review related in the future. But until that's over, go give that theory on the death of the Seven Deadly Sins a watch. Because I did put a lot of thought into that one. Considering that there was only like 15 chapters out at the time. So yeah, while it might be a bit dated, I still think it holds up pretty well. But yeah, with all that said and done, I hope you guys had an awesome day.